Hello! This lecture is going to be covering the information from your chapter 9 of your Marib text, which is over muscles and muscle tissue. So we're just going to be really be talking about um, like the microscopic anatomy of muscle um, and the different components that make up um, that, you know, microscopic and cellular anatomy, and then talking about um, physiology of the muscle, so what happens when the muscle contracts, um, and then how we can like measure that and how to change the strength or force of our contraction. Okay, in lab, you're going to be spending time actually going through the muscles in your body and naming them. Um, so the more gross anatomy um, will be covered in lab, um, as well as talking about the muscles' um, actions, so what kind of movement they're able to produce, and their origins and insertions. Okay, so um, in lecture, we're just really talking about microscopic anatomy and then the physiology um, of muscle contractions. All right, so muscles make up nearly half of the body's mass, right? So it's um, a lot of muscles in our body. Muscles are cool because they can transform chemical energy um, in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which we talked about in um, a previous chapter, into mechanical energy, okay, which is capable of exerting a force or allowing our bodies to move. Okay, so we're going to break this chapter into different types of muscle tissue, um, which will just take a few minutes to cover characteristics of muscle tissue, so different ana anatomical features on the microscopic level that we can see um, in muscles, and then talking about muscle function. So that's going to be really the physiology um, of um, how muscles are able to move and contract. Okay, these first two points we're going to be covering in part one um, of this lecture, and the muscle functions, the physiology um, is quite involved and pretty heavy stuff. So we're going to be covering that in a part two. Okay, so part two is definitely going to be um, a lot heavier on physiology. Um, and I would definitely recommend that you take time definitely to watch that. I know some students are watching part one and not part two of the lectures each week. Um, I'm not sure if you're running out of time or just get bored or whatever. Um, but this week, the muscle physiology is very complicated um, and have a lot of different ions um, and different neurotransmitters and chemicals involved in contraction of muscles. So I think watching um, part two of this lecture is going to be really important for your success. Okay. Um, throughout this chapter, you're going to see a lot of different terms that um, have myo, mice, and sarco um, as prefixes. And anytime you see those terms in this chapter or chapters in the future, it's always going to be prefixes for some sort of muscle. Um, so, you know, in a normal cell, we have the cell's cytoplasm. In the muscle cell, it's called the sarcoplasm of the muscle. Okay, so you're always going to see these three prefixes um, for terms you already should know, uh, but just that are specialized and a little bit different when we're talking about muscle tissues in particular. Okay, there's three types of muscle tissue um, that we're going to talk about, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle. Um, we'll talk about, you know, the differences of them on a cellular level, and I'll show you some pictures of those. Um, we talked about it a bit in histology, um, but not too much. But the majority of this chapter, we're really going to be focusing on skeletal muscle contractions um, and how, you know, on an uh, cellular level, these muscles are able to contract. Cardiac and smooth muscle have similar um, ways of contracting, um, but we're not really going to spend time to talk about the differences. Um, we're just really going to spend the time, because that's all the time we have, talking about skeletal muscle contraction specifically. Okay, um, Only the skeletal and smooth muscle fibers are elongated and referred to as muscle fibers. Um, cardiac muscles a little bit different and their ways of contracting is even more different than um, skeletal and smooth. Okay, so yeah. All right, so just first of all, like histology differences between the three types of muscle. Um, so skeletal muscle is um, what we see attached to bones um, or to skin and some of our facial muscles. And it's what's going to allow our body to move, right? So when you think about like the movement, you're walking, picking up something, that's all going to be skeletal muscle, okay? 
Um, so we have um, skeletal muscle fibers are longest of all the muscles and they have striations or stripes. So if you look at this image here, you can see the different stripes on the muscle. Those are the striations. And a lot of times skeletal muscle will be referred to as voluntary muscle um, and that is because it can be consciously controlled. Okay, so it's voluntary. We have um, the ability to think about moving a part of our body and then that skeletal muscle contracts due to our voluntary or conscious control of the muscle. Okay, skeletal muscle has the ability to con contract rapidly, um, so our movements can be very quick, um, but it can tire easily as well, so it doesn't take much for our muscles to become fatigued, um, but it is incre incredibly powerful, um, especially if you work those muscles, um, you can gain a lot of skeletal muscle strength to lift you know, very heavy items. Okay, so skeletal muscle, um, the key words here I'm going to say are going to be voluntary. It's really important you know skeletal muscle is voluntary or under our conscious control. And then striated, you'll all see um, it referred to a lot. Okay. We also have cardiac muscle. And this is muscle that's only found in the heart. Um, and it makes up the bulk of our heart wall. So it's going to be what allows our heart to pump blood through the body. Um, and obviously, blood has to go a long ways, go from the heart all the way to the tips of our toes or top of our head. Um, so you need a lot of force behind your uh, muscle contractions in your heart in order for blood to move. Okay, so it's going to be um, making up the majority of our heart along with uh, some connective tissues. Um, it is also striated like skeletal muscle. So you can see in the picture the little lines. Those are striations. Um, but unlike skeletal tissues, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscles, excuse me, um, cardiac muscles are involuntary. So they cannot be controlled consciously. Okay, which makes sense because you don't have to think about, you know, t telling your heart to beat. You don't consciously have that thought. It just happens involuntary. Okay, out of your control. Skelet uh, cardiac muscles do contract at a steady rate um, due to the heart's own pacemaker, which we'll talk a lot more about in BI-208 in the cardiac system unit. Um, but our nervous system does innervate it and can change the rate of um, contraction. Okay, so some keywords for this that you need to know. Again, um, involuntary is really important. It is not in our conscious control. Um, however, we are still um, uh, striated like skeletal muscle. Okay. And then the last type of muscle is smooth muscle, um, which is going to be found in the walls of hollow organs. So our stomach, bladder, um, different airways, our whole digestive tract is lined um, not lined because epithelial tissue lines the surfaces and ca cavities, um, but it makes up the majority of those organs. Okay, so in order for food to pass through our stomach and through our intestines, there needs to be something that's like pushing it along. It just doesn't go on its own. So that smooth muscle is responsible for, you know, pushing food stuff along or contracting um, in our urinary bladder, how, whatever. Um, all those different things in our airways. Um, smooth muscle is not striated. So if you look at it, you can see the nuclei um, in these muscle cells, but there's none of those like little stripes, right, that go through it like the other two tissues. And like cardiac muscle, um, uh, smooth muscle is also involuntary. So again, we're not consciously thinking about you know, digesting our food and mixing up our stomach contents. It's just happening on its own, okay? Um, so smooth muscle, we have, um, again, involuntary is really important that you know that, as well as um, non-striated, okay? So each of the two words that I wrote on the three different muscle types um, there's a different combination of voluntary or involuntary or striated and non-striated. They're all different. So just with those two words, you should be able to tell me what type of muscle um, we're describing, okay? Whether it's skeletal, cardiac, or smooth, okay? 
all muscles, regardless of if it's cardiac, skeletal, or smooth, uh, share four main characteristics. Okay, the first is excitability or responsiveness, and that is the ability to receive and respond to stimuli. Okay, so obviously that's very apparent in our skeletal muscles. We have to consciously think about contracting them to make them move, but the other muscles as well still have um, nerve innervation that controls the rate of contraction, controls um, the... Um, you know, the food moving through our system, it's not just happening without any sort of innervation still. We still have to be able to have those muscles be excited, okay? Contractility is the ability to shorten forcibly when stimulated. Um, so all of our muscles, they're muscles because they can contract, and their contraction is what's allowing movement, whether that be movement of the heart, to the organs, or our skeletal muscle movement. Extensibility is the ability to be stretched, so our muscles can stretch, um, but they're also elastic, so they have elasticity, which is the ability to recoil um, to resisting length. So even though we can stretch them, they have these elastic fibers that bring them back to their original length. Okay, so those are the four main characteristics. Again, you're going to see in all muscles, regardless of what type. Okay. Muscles also have four important functions, um, producing movement, so all locomotion and manipulation um, is due to muscles. Their ability to contract is what allows us to move both in space and then inside of our body. So walking, digesting, pumping blood, all of that is due to these muscle contractions, the movements they're creating. Um, important in maintaining posture and body position. So allowing us to just stand upright and not collapse, right? That is just muscles working. Um, stabilizing joints. So we talked about joints in the last chapter. Um, keeping those joints um, stabilized. We talked about, um, you know, having um, the muscles just working to produce um, stability there. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. And then also generating heat as they contract. Um, so that affects our... Um, homeostasis of our body temperature so muscles when they contract you can shiver and that generates heat to warm our body up if we get too cold okay each muscle um, is going to um, receive information from a nerve have arteries and veins so blood flow to and from them um, it's important that we have nerves innervating, especially I'm going to just talk about skeletal muscles right now, um, our skeletal muscle, um, to control the activity of it, okay? Um, so these nerves we call motor nerves um, that are going to go and innervate the muscle and tell it that it needs to contract, okay? Um, the arteries and veins are really important because the muscle fibers are using a lot of energy um, and they need a lot of things in order to function properly, including oxygen and nutrients in order to make the energy that they need. So um, the arteries bringing blood to the muscles provide them with those nutrients and then veins um, take away um, a byproduct. So different wastes are carried out through the veins, okay? Skeletal muscles also have um, a bunch of different connective tissues covering them, um, which we'll talk about different types, but the connective tissues just help to support um, and reinforce the muscles, okay? So there's a, different, a number of different types of connective tissues. All of them, again, are just going to be there to support or reinforce but let's talk about the different types, okay? So let's talk from external, so most superficial, to internal, deep. So most superficially, we have the epimecium, which is made up of dense, irregular connective tissue. And this surrounds the entire muscle, okay? So if this is, um, this looks like your femur, so this might be one of your quadricep muscles. Let's say that is your rectus femoris. I don't really know if that's what it is, but let's, let's say that's what it is. Um, the epimecium is going to be covering the whole outside of the muscle, okay? So kind of just holding the whole muscle together. 
And then you'll see that the muscle itself is made up of um, these smaller and smaller units. Okay, so we have the whole muscle outside here. Um, and then we can divide the muscle into these little fascicles, which are these little smaller units that make up the muscle. So here is a muscle fascicle um, that's kind of taken out. Okay, the muscle fascicle is surrounded by the paramecium. Okay, so the epimecium is on the outside. The paramecium is going to be covering all of these little fascicles within the whole muscle. Okay, so you're going to have a number of these paramecium's surrounding each fascicle. Okay, and then we can go even smaller and look at the endomecium. And the endomecium is going to be areolar connective tissue surrounding individual muscle fibers. Okay, so the fascicle um, is this part there, right? We can pull out even smaller pieces of the fascicle, and those little pieces are called muscle fibers. Okay, and the muscle fibers are covered again in the endomecium. Okay, so this around each muscle fiber would be the endomecium. Okay, so each individual little thing here would be an endomecium. You have the perimecium around that, which you can see here. And then most superficially, the epimecium around the whole muscle itself. Okay, so if we were to zoom in here, you can't really see it. But in each fascicle, you'd have the endomeciums lined up right around um, each muscle fiber. Okay, and this again, we're, this is skeletal tissue. Skel not skeletal tissue, skeletal muscle. Okay, so those are the three layers of connective tissues around the muscle. Okay. Muscles span joints and attach to bones. Um, so we talked about this in the last chapter. Um, but muscles are going to attach to bone in at least two places. In insertion, which is going to be a movable bone. And in origin, which is going to be um, immovable. Okay, so the insertion always moves towards the origin when the muscle contracts. You're going to be talking about this a lot more in lab. Okay, and attachments um, to these bones can be direct or indirect. Okay, so it kind of depends on what muscle we're looking at. But a direct connection, the epimecium, the outside layer, is fused to the periosteum of the bone or perichondrium of the cartilage. So that outside layer of the bone is attached to the outside layer of the um, uh, muscle itself. Okay, an indirect connection is the connective tissue wrapping extends beyond the muscle as a tendon um, or an aponeurosis. Okay, so it's not like a direct connection. It's a longer um, tendon or an aponeurosis. It's just like a sheet, a flat tendon that's going to be connecting um, the muscles to bones. Okay. So here's that structure and organization we talked about, right? We have the muscle with the um, epimecium around the outside and the fascicle coming out, okay? And then the fascicle, we have the perimecium. So around the fascicle is a perimecium. So here is the fascicle with the perimecium coming out. In the middle of the fascicle, we have muscle fibers, and the muscle fibers are surrounded by the endomecium. Okay? So those are the three layers that we talked about. Epimecium, perimecium, and endomecium. Okay? But we can now look even more microscopically and the muscle fiber itself has small, small um, anatomical features that we need to know. So things like the myofibril and different um, sarcoplasmic reticulum, sarcolemma, and um, smaller microscopic structures that we're going to talk about now. Okay, so let's talk about 
Um, so now we're talking about like skeletal muscle fibers. So when we talk about fibers, remember we're talking about like this structure here. And now we're going to look even closer at these individual fibers. Okay, so they are the long cylindrical cells and they're going to contain multiple nuclei. Okay, and remember, in muscle cells, the muscle fibers, um, the terms we had for things before are going to be similar, but with just that sarco um, prefix. So the sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber. The sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm of the muscle fiber. Okay, and there's going to be some uh, modified organelles in the muscle as well that we're going to take a closer look at. So we have myofibrils, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and T-tubules. Okay, and it's important that you know all these structures now because when you start talking about physiology, you're going to be seeing all this stuff coming into play and you're going to need to know not only the names of them, but the functions of them as well. Okay, so let's start talking about myofibrils. Okay, so myofibrils are densely packed rod-like elements, and they're going to make up the muscle fiber, the muscle cell. Okay, so this is the muscle fiber. Now I'm going to take even smaller myofibrils out, and they uh, make up about 80% of the muscle cell volume. So the majority of the muscle is made up of these myofibrils. Okay, myofibrils are packed together to make a muscle fiber. Muscle fibers are packed together um, to make the, um, uh, the fascicle, muscle fascicle, and then um, the fascicles come together to make up the whole muscle. Okay, and there are some features of the um, myofibril that you're going to have to know. So striations, sarcomeres, myofilaments, um, and the molecular composition of them. Okay, so we're going to spend some time talking about that. So in the myofibril, again, the next few slides we're talking about structures of the myofibril, which make up the um, muscle fiber. We have these striations, which we saw on the first few slides talking about the different types of muscles. Striations are just stripes formed from repeating series of dark and light bands. Okay. Um, so we have dark regions that we call A bands and light regions that are I bands. Okay, and the, the repeating series of A band, I band, A band, I band is what makes up the striations that you see here below. Okay, so again, A bands are dark, I are going to be light. Okay. We also have um, sarcomeres. Sarcomeres are going to be the smallest contractile unit of a muscle fiber. So if you have a question that's asked, what is the functional unit of a muscle fiber? It is sarcomere. And I guarantee you, you're going to see that both in lab and lecture. Okay, so it contains an A band, which is the dark region and half of an I band at each end. Okay, and the I band again is the light region. It is the area between two Z discs. Okay, so these are just some names you're gonna have to memorize. But below you see the Z discs are these zigzaggy shapes. Z disc here, Z disc here. So the area between those two Z discs is your sarcomere. Okay, remember we have the A band is the dark region. So we have, whoops, um, a, a band is the dark region in the middle. And the I band technically is going to go between um, the A bands. But see, the Z disc kind of goes down the middle there. So you only have half of the I band within the sarcomere on each side. Okay, And the sarcomeres are going to butt up next to each other. So we have one sarcomere in the middle. And then on each side, you would have another sarcomere. Okay, but they're the contractile units. So when the muscle contracts, the sarcomere is what's going to shorten. Okay, so that's where the contraction in the muscle is actually happening. Okay, 
What's making up these different bands and zones are what we call myofilaments. Okay, so we see here the A band, that dark region. We see it's I'm cover coloring red on red. These red parts, those are one type of myofilament. And then the blue parts are a second type of myofilament. Okay, so that's what's making up um, the sarcomeres. So the myofilaments, there's two different types, like I said. The th um, we'll start with the ones on the outside that make up the I band. So the I band are these make, made up of these blue guys, which we call the thin filaments. Okay, so the I band is made up of actin myofilaments, which are the thin filaments. You're going to need to know actin is the thin filament. Okay, so actin make up the I band, and they're going to partially go over the A band. Okay, and they're going to be anchored to those Z discs on either end of the sarcomere here. Okay, myosin filaments are going to be the thick filaments. Myosin thick, actin thin. They're what's going to be actually making up the um, A band in the middle there. So you see these red bits in the middle, those are the myosin, and you see they're thicker than the actin. And that's what's making up the um, A band, A band here, okay? And there is some overlap, so you do have some actin coming into the A band, but the amount of actin in the A band depends on if the muscle is contracted or relaxed, okay? And the myosin filaments are connected in the middle at this M line, we call it, M for the middle, Z is at Z edge, <laughs> okay? And those names of the Z, M, I, A, all that stuff is just memorization, okay? So you're going to have to memorize those things. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the myofilaments. So again, um, the thick filament is made up of the protein myosin. So myosin makes the thick filament. And these myofilaments is what's actually going to allow the muscle to contract. Okay, so remember again that this, these are called myofilaments. So during contraction, this part here on the myosin, we call the myosin head. So the head of this myosin is what's going to be attaching to the thin filament actin, and it's gonna form what we call a cross bridge. And we'll talk about this in more depth when we talk about the physiology. But the head of the myosin attaches to the actin thin filament to form a cross bridge, and that's what's gonna allow contraction to happen. Okay, and you can see that these heads on the myosin are kind of in a staggered arrangement, um, which is good because it allows for um, the cross bridges to form on actin um, in a number of different places. It doesn't have to exactly line up because you have myosin heads everywhere that you could possibly need one to form that um, cross bridge. Okay, so thick filament myosin. Okay, an important part of the myosin heads, it's what's going to being, be making the cross bridges or the connections between myosin and actin. Okay, so then our thin filaments is made up of actin. Okay, and you can see in this image here, um, this actin, you actually have two like layers kind of woven together of those actin subunits. And on the actin subunits, you have little divots that are called myosin binding sites. And those myosin binding sites is where the head of the myosin is going to attach, okay? And form, again, that cross bridge. And that's, again, what's allowing contraction to happen, okay? Another important feature, which we'll talk about more in a couple of slides here in the next section, probably, um, of actin filament is you have other regulatory proteins, troponin and tropomyosin, 
which you can see here, tropomyosin is kind of this rope that's going along the actin, and troponin are these little yellow proteins sticking out here that's holding tropomyosin there. And that's going to regulate um, the cross bridge formation. Okay, so we'll talk about it again later on. But at rest, um, tropomyosin, tropomyosin is covering the active sites or the binding sites, I'll call them. That's what it says here. Binding sites. So at rest, tropomyosin is covering those binding sites. So myosin cannot form a cross bridge with actin because of tropomyosin being in the way. So in order for muscle contraction to happen, we need to move tropomyosin out of the way so that actin and myosin can bind. Okay, and we talk about physiology, we'll talk about how that happens. Okay, but you need to know first, again, the uh, just anatomical structure of these things to understand the physiology later on. Okay. So that are, those are the myofilaments. Again, this is a myofilament as well. Okay, some other anatomical features of the myofibril you need to know. We have the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is just the muscular name for the endoplasmic reticulum. And these are going to be little tubules that surround each myofibril. Okay, most of them wrong longitudinally or along the length of the muscle cell. Remember, the muscle cells are kind of long cylinders. So they're going to run along the length of the muscle cells. They also have structures called terminal cisternae that form a little perpendicular cross right at the junction of the A and I bands. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in here. These blue parts, these are the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? Going along the length of the muscle cell, myofibrils, okay? And then the terminal cisternae are the parts that go perpendicularly along. So you have a terminal cisternae at each end of the sarcoplasmic reticulum here. See how those spots? Those are all terminal cisternae, okay? Sarcoplasmic reticulum is really important because it controls intracellular calcium levels, okay, which you need to know that. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is responsible for storing and releasing calcium into the muscle cell, okay? So sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium. And we will see this um, when we talk about the muscle physiology, so it's really important that you know that, Okay. And then another structure that you need to know are called T-tubules. So T-tubules are formed by the protrusion of the sarcolemma deep into the cell interior. Remember the sarcolemma is like the um, cell membrane of the muscle fiber. So it increases the surface area of the muscle it's continuous with the extracellular space, so it creates kind of like this little divot um, into the muscle. It's important because it allows electrical nerve transmission to reach into the interior of the muscle fibers. Okay, so if the, if the surface of the muscle fiber is like this, the T-tubule goes down into the muscle fiber and allows things to get deep into that muscle fiber. Okay, and again, in physiology, we'll talk about it. They are at each AI band junction between the terminal cisternae. So if I zoom back in, right, we talked about the terminal cisternae being here, part of that sarcoplasmic reticulum. The T-tubules are these parts in the middle of, um, of each terminal cisternae. Okay, and each set of T-tubule and terminal cisternae together 
we call a triad. Okay, so I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna zoom in here. So the two terminal cisternae, whoops, two terminal cisternae and the T-tubule in the middle, this here is the triad. Okay. And again, all this stuff is going to be super important when we get to the physiology of muscles. Okay, so this is just showing everything we've kind of talked about. We have the muscle fiber, right, with the sarcolemma on the outside, the individual myofibrils. In the myofibrils, here we have myofibrils as well. You can see the individual myofilaments, the thick filament myosin, the thin filament actin. You can see the blue sarcoplasmic reticulum. You can see the terminal cisternae running perpendicular here to the muscle. And in the middle, I guess I can change my color. In the middle, you have your T-tubules. Okay? So that's the basic anatomy of the muscle cells. Okay? Muscle contraction, like I said previously, is the activation of cross bridges between actin he uh, myosin heads and the actin um, attachment sites to generate force. So you should all kind of know what contraction is, but basically it's just the shortening of the muscle fiber. Okay. Contraction ends when cross bridges become inactive. So cross bridges are what's allowing contraction and what's going to actually be shortening the muscle. So it's pulling the thin filaments inwards um, and shortening the sarcolemma itself. Okay, We call this the sliding filament model of contraction. Okay, because we have our myosin and actin filaments, and they're going to slide against each other. So what's actually causing this sh shortening is the thin filaments, actin, sliding past the thick filaments, causing more overlap to happen. So the, the fibers themselves don't change length. All they're doing is just overlapping. Okay, so when you're fully relaxed, you have the Z-discs on each side, um, and, you know, the myosin in the middle, M-line right in the middle. And you have a, not very much overlap between the myosin and actin. Okay? So that's at rest. So the fi sliding filament theory is saying that the Z-discs are going to be coming closer together. So the actin and myosin are going to overlap more. So contraction happens when the nervous system stimulates the muscle fiber. Again, those myosin heads bind to the actin, forming those cross bridges, which causes the contraction or sliding process to begin. Okay, so when we contract, now you can see this image, these Z discs are going to be closer together, and there's a lot of overlap between actin and myosin, okay? So that you have the sarcomere is actually shortening, coming closer together, and that's all a contraction is, the shortening of, again, the sarcomere. Okay, so as contraction's happening, the cross bridges form and break several times, and each time they pull, pull the thin filaments closer and closer to that M line kind of in a ratcheting action. Okay, so it's not just one cross bridge. Every time the myosin binds to the actin, it pulls it a little bit closer, and then it'll bind again, pulling it a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer, until you have the shortening or contraction of the muscle. Okay, so um, again, these terms are just things you have to know, but during contraction, your Z discs are pulled towards the M line. So again, Z discs on the outside, pulled in towards the M line in the middle here. The I bands shorten. Z discs are coming closer. The H zone disappears. And the A bands are moving closer to each other. Okay, so I'm not gonna ask you specifics about those, but if it helps you visualize what's happening, if you know these different terms, um, it might be good to look at that. Okay. 
All right, so the decision to move, to contract, is activated by the brain, right? And this is for skeletal muscle, right? We have voluntary or conscious control. So our brain makes a decision, transmits that down the spinal cord to the motor neurons. The motor neurons are what's going to activate the muscle fibers and tell them to contract. Okay, neurons and muscle cells both are excitable cells capable of action potentials. Okay, so in previous chapter, we talked about a thing called the resting membrane potential, right, which is the separation of charge or voltage between inside and outside of the cell. So if you have that resting membrane potential, you have the potential to be excited, okay? And the excitement is just due to ions, right? And an ion is something that has a charge. So if it has a positive charge, it's a cation. It has a negative charge, it's an anion. The movement of these ions in or out of the cells is going to change this resting membrane potential, okay? Because if you remember, most cells are on negative 70 millivolts, or negative 90, depending on the type of cell, okay? At rest, that's the resting membrane potential. So if we have, let's say, a positive charge that we're moving into the cell, we're going to make that inside more positive, right? So that's going to allow the cell to become excited. So the movement of these ions is all that's happening in order to cause muscles to contract, Okay? And we'll talk about all of this in more detail um, in part two of this lecture. But it's really important that you know the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, abbreviated ACH, is the neurotransmitter that's responsible for transmitting information from our motor neuron to the muscle cell. Okay, and again, I'll show you images of all of this um, in a few slides. Okay. We'll go through step by step what ions are doing and how that's changing that resting membrane potential. Okay, another structure you need to know um, that's involved in this process are ion channels, which we've already talked about previously. The ion channels, again, are going to allow ions to move either in or out of the cell, depending on what type of channel it is, what type of ions are moving. So we have chemically gated channels which are opened in response to some sort of chemical messenger. So a neurotransmitter is a great example. So when we talk about chemically gated channels um, for muscles, we're always going to see acetylcholine binding to a um, chemically gated channel. And that binding of acetylcholine is what's going to allow that channel to open and have ions to move. Okay? We also have voltage-gated channels that are going to open or close in response to a change in voltage in the membrane potential. Okay, so let's say in this first example here, we have acetylcholine attaching. Okay, that's a chemical messenger that's going to open this chemically-gated channel. Okay, let's say this allows sodium, which is a positive ion, into the inside of the cell. If the inside of the cell is normally negative and we add a positive charge, that's going to change the voltage, right? Because you're adding a positive voltage to a negative voltage. That change of voltage is what's going to allow these voltage-gated channels to open, okay? So if this voltage channel, say it wants a more positive voltage and the sodium is coming in, making the inside a little bit more positive than normal, that change in voltage is going to allow this voltage-gated channel to open and allow some sort of other ion to move in or maybe even move out, depending on what that channel is. Okay, so these are the two different types of channels, and we're going to be talking about specific ones in the next lecture and what exactly they're doing. Okay, so it's important you understand the difference. Okay. And then some more basic anatomy of... Trying to, before we get into the physiology, just talk about the names of different structures. 
Again, we're going to have neurons, specifically motor neurons, innervating or attaching to a muscle. And this happens at a spot we call the neuromuscular junction, right? Neuro, because it's the neuron and it's attaching to the muscle. Okay. We haven't talked about neurons yet because we haven't talked about the nervous system, but neurons have what we call an axon, which is a long thread-like extension that is going to carry information from the central nervous system to the skeletal muscle. So here, this long thread is part of the axon of this neuron, and it's going to carry information down to the um, neuromuscular junction between the neuron and the muscle. Okay, you can see at the end you're going to have branches of this neuron that are going to create these different um, synapses, we call them, onto the muscle. Okay, and again that's called the neuromuscular junction or sometimes motor end plate. Okay, each muscle fiber has one neuromuscular junction with one motor neuron. Okay, so the axon comes in, creates this neuromuscular junction, and at the very end of these axons, so if I were to zoom way in on this, at the end of the axon, there's going to be little bulb-looking structures that are actually going to be forming that synapse between the neuron and the muscle. Okay, and that also has some names. So right, we have the axon of the neuron coming in, and that bulb at the end of the neuron, that is called the axon terminal. Okay, so that little bulb is the axon terminal. It is going to synapse onto the muscle, which just means form like a little connection. And it's going to create this little space. So you can see this is the muscle down here. All right, we have the axon terminal up top. And in between the axon terminal and the muscle, we have a little space here. Right, that space is called the synaptic cleft. Is the space between the axon terminal, the end of the axon of the motor neuron, and the muscle um, cell itself. Okay. Inside the axon terminal, there are specific structures you need to know called synaptic vesicles. And a vesicle is just a little ball that's going to hold something. So synaptic vesicles are going to hold the neurotransmitter. In this case, specifically acetylcholine will be found in these synaptic vesicles, okay? So the synaptic vesicles hold the neurotransmitter and keep it for when the um, neuron is ready to release and tell the motor, the muscle to contract. It holds that acetylcholine to be released and be the chemical messenger that's telling the muscle to contract, okay? And these little folds, in the muscle, right, see these little folds here? Those are called junctional folds. And on the junctional folds, there's gonna be millions of acetylcholine receptors, which are gonna be chemically, chemical gated um, channels, right? So if I zoom in, these acetylcholine receptors, I'm just gonna, I covered them up, but I'm gonna draw them in here. They're little ion channels that are going to allow, again, acetylcholine to bind to them. That binding of acetylcholine, again, released from the synaptic vesicles, is going to open them and allow some sort of ion to flow. Okay? And we're going to talk about this in more detail when we talk about the physiology in the next um, lecture, but just to give you an idea, a little foreshadowing. Okay, but those are all the important structures you need to know. Okay, so this lecture we talked about just anatomy, all these different structures. 
Next lecture, we'll talk about the physiology and exactly what's happening step by step, which ions are moving, what the neurotransmitter is doing, how that's causing the myosin and actin to bind. Okay, and we'll talk about this in the next um, lecture, part two. But we'll start by talking about the events at that neuromuscular junction. Talk about how that's going to excite the muscle fiber. The excitation contraction coupling, so how that causes some sort of uh, contraction, and the cross bridge cycling. Okay, so we'll cover all of that in part two um, of this lecture. All right, see you in part two.